welcome to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast. Uh, the Legendino is enjoying the, I suppose, the beginnings of summer where you are, aren't you? Um, yeah, you're looking tanned. Spring is in the air, and all the more so because today is a chance to meet virtually someone to whom I owe an enormous debt. Oh, because uh, what in I've cash. ended up. Um, we'll, we'll 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 sit down and come to some kind of arrangement <laughs> because uh, what I've been wasting my life doing over over the, the past nearly thirty years is really walking in 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 the steps that were first laid down by a book called Football Against the Enemy by Simon Cooper, who I've never met and now have the chance to to meet virtually. I mean, that, it's such an important book laid out the the path of analysing football in a anthropological context, in a, in a social context, which is the, the trick that I've, I've, I've tried to get away with for all these years. So uh, it's very nice to meet someone to whom I owe a debt. And also along with that debt comes admiration because uh, Simon, I believe, has, has kept a little foot in the toy shop. But while the likes of, of, of myself are kind of stranded in, in, in the toy shop, He's also branched out and writes on such weighty matters um, that has my admiration as well. So thank you very much for joining us. Come on down, Mr. Simon Cooper. Thank you very much, Tim. And almost everything I know about South American football, I know from reading you. So uh, the compliments is returned. Well, it, yeah, financially, financially, you're on equal terms at the moment. I'm glad to we sorted that out. We couldn't afford you otherwise, Simon, because uh, uh, Tim, as he often tells us, is hosting an entire family of uh, uh, people in Brazil. He needs every penny he can get. Oh, it's hard work. It's yeah, hard work. That, Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> tell us something Don't about the book that, uh, Tim, before we get into what we're here to discuss for the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast, this book that... Uh, Tim has so gloriously, uh, you know, uh, described for us uh, what what's it about essentially? Because he says it's it was, it was about it was about a young man on a on a shoestring traveling the world. I, I think ah. and analyzing it through football. Is that fair? Yeah, it came out. That's right. It came out thirty years ago. I went to twenty two countries and sort of with the question of what does football mean in each country including Brazil, including Argentina, but just around the world. It was a massively overambitious project. But I think it was a good question, you know, what what does football tell us about a country is sort of the pretentious way of putting it. And, and one, of, one of the countries that you know best, of course, is Holland, because it's, it's where you grew up. Um, That's right. So well, you, you are, are from Africa. Africa. You're an yeah, African. Son of Africa. I've done my research, yes. yeah. Yes. So yeah, born in Uganda, and my parents are originally from South Africa. So, yeah, many, many different connections there, yeah. So you are one of the few people who will understand me when I say Bolakaluk Shreisrekte. No, I don't oh. understand that. <laughs> Which well, I that? knew it. He makes them up. <laughs> I've been saying that for years. <laughs> I have a mate who's married to a Dutch woman, and he swears this is ridiculous referee. And Edgar David a understood it. Okay, oh, okay. Oh, well, we're getting oh, yeah. <laughs> Yes. These well, strange gargling northern European noises that uh, that they make, but your knowledge of, of Holland is is especially pertinent because um, the person who we want to focus on today is, and again the pronunciation is going to be all wrong, Johan Neuskins. How do you say it? Go on, Neuskins, Neuskins, Johan Neuskins, Neuskins. It's easy, Tim. Um, and by the way, before we get to Johan Neuskins and the Neuskins, Neuskins. <laughs> Before we get to your niche, kids. you've got to be a naysayer to do this. <laughs> and the particular match that we're going to focus on today, which is a cracker of a match in many different ways, by the way, um, I should really say um, we should really start off, uh, Tim, by um, singing a song to Simon. And um, him being Dutch, he'll know exactly what it means. Um, it goes like this. Ja mohan leva, ja mohan leva, ja mohan leva, you ti hundred yo, ja viska han leva, ja viska han leva, ja viska han leva, you ti hundred yo. Happy birthday. 
I think that's a Scandinavian version. In Dutch, it's long zo he leve, but I think what you're singing might be an actual Scandinavian version, but not having any Scandinavian knowledge, I can't I can't say for sure. Well, I, I'm just learning how to say Neskin, so I wouldn't <laughs> dream of trying to do the double Dutch. But you, literally, you were, um, your birthday was yesterday. That's right, yes. I am so, now 55. Which is don't worry, I'm, I'm, I'm at least a decade older than you, <laughs> which God. is even more amazing. Um, I'm but, somewhere in the middle, in the midfield, which was obviously where Nayskins played. Oh, All roads lead to Johan. I like the way he did that. So we're looking at a particular match in the World Cup of 1974, which I specifically remember for reasons that Tim will go into later on. But it's the 3rd of July, um, 1974, Brazil versus Holland. There's all to play for. Uh, what do you remember about that match, if you're old enough to remember it, Simon? I was four years old. I, at that time, didn't know that the Netherlands existed because we were living in London. So everything I know about that match, I've discovered subsequently. Mm. I was nine, just turned nine, and this was my first kind of World Cup. I kicked every ball. And one of one of the big themes for it, because we were all waiting for Brazil after Brazil 70. We were all waiting for it. And from the very first game, the opening game of the World Cup, a nil-nil draw with Yugoslavia, we were disappointed. We were disappointed. And we were disappointed. Uh, and this is, it's almost a game when the baton change hands from one footballing culture to another. Uh, because what Holland do is, and Brazil just had no language to describe what what Holland, the way that, that Holland played. Um, they didn't scout Holland before the World Cup. They didn't know what they were they were coming up, coming up against. So one of my favourite favourite things is I came across a few years ago a pile of Brazilian football magazines from the early 70s. And in 72, João Havelange, in a bid to try and win the FIFA presidency, he organised a kind of mini World Cup in Brazil. Uh, and they invited everyone and, and most nations pulled out. And Holland pulled out. And the, the magazine says... Yeah, Holland have just pulled out, and between ourselves, they won't be missed. <laughs> I think the Dutch uh, in 72 thought that. I think the Dutch in spring 74 thought, we're going to the World Cup. If we reach the second round, it will be great. Uh, obviously, a big country like Brazil or Germany is going to win. But just the, and so, so the first time they really saw him was during the World Cup. And the Brazilian scout, who was in the, so he's ready with his pen and paper. And he, he just threw it away. He said, I can't describe what they're doing because they'd never seen it before. They'd never seen the amount of pressure on the ball that Holland put them under. I don't think anyone had seen that in international football. The only teams doing that were Ajax and possibly Feyenoord in the Dutch league and in the European Cup. But, I mean, if you watch the video of that match, but of also of all Holland's previous matches in the World Cup, they catch the opposition sometimes 15, 20 yards offside yeah. because the whole team rushes up to press and they're all in the opposition half. And, yeah, teams like Brazil just never seen this before, that uh, pace, that kind of storming pressure, and then the offside trap. They rendered South American football obsolete in this tournament because they beat the big three and the big three, they just couldn't lay a glove on them. They, you, they beat Uruguay. I mean, it was only 2-0. But Uruguay didn't see the ball. They thrashed Argentina. And then this, what was effectively a World Cup semi-final, it's 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 uh, it's Brazil against Holland, and they render all of them obsolete. It's 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 a new physical dynamic and a new conception of football. When the game is no longer one against one duels, it's a constant duel of eleven against eleven because the Dutch even have a goalkeeper who plays football. Yeah, and you have overlapping fullbacks. You have Kraft dropping back into midfield. You have Kraft suddenly moving everyone around. Kraft said, watching the other teams, he said they did things that we'd stopped doing 10 years before. <laughs> and so there's a sense when you see Holland 74 that you're watching a team a little bit like Jurgen Klopp's Liverpool. You're watching a team from the 21st century play in 1974. Yeah. And Naiskins was, was the lung power, wasn't it? I, I remember the 1998 World Cup. I was in I was in London. Uh, I was in the Bar Italia watching Holland Argentina, and Nayskins is on the coaching staff. Yeah, and there's some Dutch people in there, and every time he appears, they get down on the floor and bow, 
and 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 chant Nayskins, Nayskins, Nayskins. My question here is: Is uh, this is this is very trite, really? But is is Nayskins Calvinistic worth e- ethic applied to football? And was he easier for the average Dutch person to relate to than an idiosyncratic genius like Kreif? I mean, nobody could relate to Kreif because Kreif was a crazy genius who believed he was always right and saw things on a football field that nobody else could. So no, you couldn't play like Kreif. Whereas if you could run all day, if you had uh, the highest pain barrier in football, if you actually quite enjoyed being kicked in the head, which Naiskins did, and you also had beautiful technique. If you had everything, you could be Naiskins and you had the, the biggest willpower in football. So the Dutch, and Naiskins had no ego. You know, he saw himself as a kind of humble adjutant. He was Kreef's assistant. And so the Dutch press would start. It would, Kreef would shout, new, now, now we press. Now they pass to the left back. The left back is, is facing away. We press him. And Naiskins would lead the storm. And he could do it, you know, 10 times in, in 20 minutes. And the terror of Johan Neskin storming at you, you know, he could slide because he played baseball as a kid. So he was an, an expert slider. And in fact, mm. the goal he scores against Brazil, he's sliding. He's an incredible athlete. And then when he wins the ball, he can also do something with it. So Neskin's kind of led the charge in the 70s in Holland. Because I remember the 78 World Cup. I was old enough for that. Okay. There was great excitement when the Dutch would press. And the the Dutch would call it hunting. We're going to go hunting. It wasn't pressing. And so they would hunt against Uruguay. You see it. This defender is kind of toying on the ball. He's looking around. He's taking time like it's 1932. And Naiskins and five other people just eat this guy up. And so nobody had ever experienced that level of stress. I think if you play against Klopp's Liverpool, you recognize a bit of that. And Klopp made these videos of pressing to show his players which would start with Holland 1974. He, he was a right back originally, wasn't he? I mean, I think in in the first Ajax European Cup triumph, was it Panathinaikos? Was he a right back there? And then later goes into in the midfield? Right he had to fill in at right back because Serbia was injured. And Neskins, you know, he was a, a soldier. So you'd put him in any position. He would never complain about anything. In that first season in 1971, he's 18 when he arrives. He thinks he's just going to be in the reserve team. He's immediately in the first team. He can play any position. And by the time, by 1973, he's 21 years old. He's lifting the European Cup for the third time. So the guy is 21. He's grown up one of the poorest people in the Netherlands. Um, You know, he would go door to door with his dad begging for peels so that they could feed them to their their little animals in this piece of land they rented. He failed two years of primary school. He couldn't learn. He had a terrible inferiority complex about that. By the age of 21, he's won three European Cups. And at 22, he is the best player, I think, in the match against Brazil. So he's a he's a better soldier of orange than Rutger Hauer. Rutger Hauer looks a, like a big version of Neskins, uh, that same kind of long, sweeping hair. Neskins, he was terrifying, but he was quite small and slight. You know, he, he was not a big man, but he he was terrifying. Yeah, I think this um, this match and this generation of uh, the World Cup, which I remember very well, not least because I used to run a book at school at the age of 14. And, well, you laughed him, but this World Cup earned me uh, some lunch money, some dinner money, some pocket money, and many others, because I'd started off saying, look, you can't, you can't bet on my favourites. And my favourites were Brazil, coming from, as you said, the 1970 World Cup, you thought, no, they've got to win it. But as a safety bet, I also said you can't bet on the Netherlands or Germany, which I think is quite astute for a 14-year-old. Mm. You know, I got I got two of the finalists in that, mm. and the third one was the obvious favourite from the last World Cup. Bets on Zaire but, were, were duly accepted. <laughs> yeah, I think I gave something like 500 to 1, yeah. and one or two clever clogs at school decided to put 10p. I don't even know if they put 10p. They probably only put one penny on Zaire, but it was a penny that thankfully I was happy to accept. But the, one of the other distinguishing factors for me about this World Cup, you mentioned the hair. On both sides, <laughs> it has to be said that these footballers were youngsters of their generation. Mm-hmm. And um, the, the hair is in all sorts of directions in Brazil. <laughs> the kind 
the so comparison with 1970 is massive. It's huge. Now look yeah. at, for example, Jarzinho. 1970, he looks like a military cadet. And, you know, by 74, he's got the full, <coughs> the full black power hair. So that, that generational change, it, it's global, isn't it? But you could tell from kick, the kickoff, really, that this wasn't going to be an ordinary game. Uh, it looked as if Brazil were outplayed in every department, not least in terms of, you know, sticking the boot in, as it were. And some of the oh, tackles, we see, yeah. some of the tackles we saw in this game would just be legal nowadays in so many different ways. That, that, that's 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 forgotten, I think, by many, but remembered a lot in South America. You know, the, when people talk about 74, Holland of 74, well, perhaps the greatest side never to have won the World Cup, um, uh, people tend to stress a lot the beauty and the, 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 the shapes uh, and the, the exchange of position. But the, the thing that the South Americans really took from that is, my God, they kick. Because the, there's yeah, so is. much pressure. And some of the, thing, the, the the tackles flying in these days, they wouldn't get you a yellow car. They get you a jail sentence. I, I agree. <laughs> I agree. I mean, the Brazilians too, and Marinho Perez, that's his name, isn't it? Marinho. Yeah. yeah. Lays out Naiskins with a, I think, an elbow. And Naiskins is revived with smelling salts. Naiskins doesn't bear any hard feelings because he plays the same way. And he likes, I think he's a sadomasochist. So he gets a thrill also from being hurt. Luis Pereira is sent off towards the end for this horrendous foul horrendous, on Naiskins. Yeah. Where he says he yeah. up to him and he kicks him in the thigh. Uh, yeah, you would now get get arrested for that. <laughs> and Naiskin says, Luis Pereira, great guy. So he he kind of likes that really hard game. But it's it's brutal. Naiskin's and von Hanachem in the Dutch midfield. Von Hanachem would, uh, I think he twice broke Naiskin's nose in club matches. Mm-hmm. And they were just, very, just great friends. It was a terrifying midfield to play against. I think the Brazilians were surprised. <clears throat> even though they gave almost as good as they got. But I think they were surprised by the strong uh, tackling and the... Uh, well, as, as well, Simon said, it, it's it's that intensity. They'd never seen anything yeah. like it before. I mean, the, admittedly, 70s played at high temperatures uh, and the final at altitude. But if you watch the games in 70, and the midfield general is, is Gerson, and he gets the ball. He was, he's all, and he's still to this day, you know, you can't shut him up. And he gets the ball and he's having a chat here and he's having a chat there and he's pointing this way and he's pointing that way and he whips out the newspaper and looks at the headlines and only then does he decide what he's going to do with it. And that's the way that they played. And and the, the Dutch, no, you can't do that because you've got seven of them running at you all, all at the same time. So they had never seen anything. It had a huge influence on them. And they tried to copy it in 78. Brazil tried to, to, to do something similar. They, they, they became... They, they really studied it and, and, and tried to, to launch to launch their own version. It is a fundamental moment in, in South American football. Argentina find a response in 78 using traditional methods, but having to up the tempo. That's why Ardiles is in the side. Ardiles wouldn't have picked himself, but he was rhythm, 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 drive, drive, drive. And Uruguay, it's the end of Uruguay until they come back in um, over, over the last 15 years. So it's a decisive moment here what the Dutch do to old-fashioned South American football. It, it's welcome to the new era. I'm not actually sure that Brazil would have won in Europe in 70. I think that the defensive unit under pressure might have crumbled. Defensively in 74, they're much better. And the keeper, Leão, is much better than the 70 keeper. Makes a fabulous save in this game. The two centre-backs yeah, yeah, we've mentioned, uh, Marinho Perez, who plays at Barcelona, Luis Pereira, who plays for Atletico Madrid for years, Really good players, much better than the 70 centre backs. And when Mourinho goes to Barcelona after the World Cup, he unites with Kaif and Neskins and he learns pressing, which Barcelona are trying to do on the Mijos. And when Mourinho Perez talks about it, it's like he's learning a new language, one he'd never yeah. encountered before. Yeah, yeah that, that, was... that, that, that idea of pushing up that's suicide. I remember yeah. talking to, to, to Paul Breitner about this. Because one of the big differences between the German side and the Dutch side is that the Germans don't press. And and Breitner said, we were just all about winning and we thought it was too risky. Yeah, but the Dutch are not pressing because they're trying to play beautiful football. They're pressing because they think this works. And they've done yeah. it at Ajax for years. It works. Michels and Kreuf, until 74, they'd never thought for a second about beautiful football. It just wasn't. They had no aesthetic view. 
And then in 74, they're really yeah. surprised that foreigners say, oh, wow, this is really beautiful. I like this football. This is attractive. And then when Holland loses the final, Krauss says, well, we, did, we really won the World Cup because we were the team that people loved. And so he starts to import this idea of aesthetics into Dutch football, which until then, they'd never thought about. That's fascinating. I had, I had no idea of that. So you start off with pure Northern European um, pragmatism and you end yeah. up on, because the end of the, much of Cruyff's career then becomes almost an idealistic crusade, doesn't it? Yeah, and you see it with Guardiola, who's Cruyff's kind of son in football, that Guardiola has a very sort of moral view of football, that this is the right way to play. And that's how this kind of um, Guardiola plays an updated version of, of Dutch football that's its kind of place in the, the football argument now. But at the time, no, Michels and Krev come together in Ajax in 65. It's a semi-professional team. It's not even the biggest team in Amsterdam. And Michels has this crazy idea, we're going to become one of the best teams in Europe, which is impossible. And they do. And over time, they develop. It turns out you overlap, you press, you play faster, you're fitter than everyone, that kind of works. So that's what you do. It just... That's how you win matches. Is, is, is this total football at this point? Yeah, they never call it that. It's, foreigners see it in 74. And from then on, I remember most people in the world, especially in South America, had never seen Krauf and Neskins, these people. There was no awareness of them. And in 74, the world sees it. And they start calling it total football, which I think is a phrase that originally comes from the NFL. There was an NFL or college football coach who used the idea, the words total football. So that becomes, but the Dutch never have a word for it. In the end, they call it the Hollandses Hall, the Dutch school. Um, but they, it's just, for them, it was just, that's how we play. What do you think of the view that the, the conceptions of space and the manipulation of space comes out of Holland because Holland is a country built on such principles with reclaimed land? Is that too trite or is there something in it? I mean, David Winner's book, Brilliant Orange, describes this brilliantly. And I think there is something in it that in a small country, you're always thinking about how to use space. I think that Krauf has a natural sense of the geometry of football and cares deeply about that. And Krauf, there's a, there's a great documentary where he's playing billiards and he's, while he's posting balls, he's saying, you see, it's the same in football. And Krauf would watch, you know, basketball or handball or volleyball and he'd see the space issues immediately. And so I, I just think it's, it was an undervalued part of football, that football is a dance for space. When you don't have the ball, you shrink space. When you do have the ball, you enlarge space. So how do we do that? And, I mean, I, I spoke to someone the other week who said in South American and in African football, the, the focus is on the individual. The individual creates space by dribbling. Yeah. And in Dutch football, also the way Craig was, no, you create space by combinations and diagonal passes and people running into space that isn't there yet. I remember talking about diagonal passes. I was there at Wembley in 92 when Barcelona won their, their first European Cup. And just being there in the stadium, it was just a lesson about the value of the diagonal pass. That's the thing I took away from that game. There's one massive diagonal one-two that I think it's Loudrop is involved in. It just blew my mind. I thought I thought it was it was uh, it was a, it was a, an amazing thing. Um, I had a question there. It's gone. I'm getting old. Well, um, you can say that again. What the thing I was? Do you want to say it again? When I, when it when it comes back to me. Okay. <laughs> I was thinking about the bit about you getting old. Oh, but no, no, first half, that. first half of this match ends up nil-nil. I don't know how it ended up nil-nil. Um after it's a, bit, it's a difficult pitch, isn't it? A lot of rain. Mm, a lot of rain yeah, in, 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 in yeah. I'm not sure yeah. if the ref helped either, to be honest. Scottish um, referee. I'm just saying, and we're going to be talking about the Scottish song in the charts, <laughs> like the Scottish play at the national uh, later on. But um I don't know how it ended up nil-nil. The finishing was off on both sides, I think. Um, but I think because of much of the action is taking place or much of the uh, main event is taking place in the midfield in particular, that it's almost like an afterthought, oh, we need to score as well. Do, do you know what I mean? There, there's, there seems to be a... Sorry. They're two very good defences. Yes. Uh, there's a terrible goalkeeper, Youngblut, who who every time the ball, ball comes near him, you feel mm -hmm. he is going to miss. 
and there's a very solid goalkeeper Leal, and there's a couple of lucky escapes at both ends. Jomblad was a bizarre selection because he was he was really old. He he hadn't played for Holland for more than yeah, a decade. I think, I think but, he played one half for Holland in the 1960s. Yeah, yeah, but he could kick, so he was he was useful yeah. for that. He he loved running out of goal. He'd come 20 yards out and boot the ball clear. So Kraus said he's a footballing goalkeeper, which is what we need. Jungwood couldn't actually play football, but he would come massively out. The weird thing is Holland should have won two World Cups, 74 and 78. They had the best goalkeeper of the 1970s, Jan van Beveren, who played for PSV, later went and played in Dallas, became a stamp dealer in Dallas. And van Beveren was a brilliant goalkeeper, but he was a line keeper, which, you know, in total football, you need the goalkeeper to occupy the whole of the half. Van Beveren didn't do that. He also didn't get on with Kraut. So there was a conflict, and I think in 72, 73, he and another PSV player had walked out of the Dutch camp. So you have the best keeper of the 70s, but you're not playing him, and instead you're playing Jan Jungblut. So you handicap yourself right from the start, and Jungblut plays two World Cup finals and doesn't do well in either. So, yeah, let's put it on him then. There was one, I can't remember if it was in the first half, I suspect it was in the second half. There was one obvious, obvious, in fact, I'm pretty sure it was the second half after the Dutch had scored the first goal. Brilliant goals, by the way, both of the Dutch mm -hmm. goals. But um, the there was a clear penalty for Brazil. I mean, I could see it without going to spec savers from way up in the gods. <laughs> but somehow this referee allowed, and the lino, to be fair, allowed the game to go well, on as well. The, the, the linos were dreadful at the time. Mm. And this is something I think that Holland used to their advantage. I mean, th there's a story that they, Holland probably shouldn't even have qualified because in the vital um, yes. qualification game against Belgium, um, that they need, I think they need to avoid defeat in order to qualify. Uh, Belgium have a goal ruled out for offside when final, Holland do the, the, do the press minute. in the final minute. Yeah. And yeah. it probably wasn't. And I think there's one in the World Cup final against Germany when he's about five yards on side. But it's not only the players who've never seen this intensity of press. It's the linos as well. So, you know, there's almost like a reflex. Yeah, yeah, flag up, flag up. Uh, and you wonder if all of those those decisions are, are, are correct. I think they worked against Brazil, but probably, you know, like they say, swings and roundabouts, you know, evens itself out over the course of 90 minutes. Uh, should we talk about the goals? Um, you've already described the first goal to a certain extent, Tim. You said it was a slider um, from Naiskins. I, I, I can't decide which is the better goal. Um, I suspect it might be the second one. Uh, Simon? I just remember both those goals so clearly because, you know, as a kid in the 70s, later in the 70s, I was playing in an amateur club like every other kid in Holland. And most weekends it would rain. The match would be rained off. So we'd all gather in the clubhouse and they'd show us videos of 1974. And so although I was not conscious in 74, I've seen those goals a hundred times. <laughs> a friend of mine said that when he and his team watched the 74 final and Naiskin scores the penalty in the first minute, all these little boys jump up cheering uh, when they're watching a video years later, even though they know what's going to happen next. Germany's going to win. <laughs> So both those goals are, are just part of my childhood memory. I think a mate, a mate of mine who, who lived in Holland for years, and he had this, the same experience. You know, he played for a, a, a team, and he's from the north. And like every time it rained, the game would get called off. And someone from the north, would, what's going on? No, you, you get out and play. And the Dutch would explain to him, no, we don't, because the, the pitch will be crap, and it, 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 it will be a, it'll be a bad game. It's totally different from the British attitude. I mean, the pitches that the English First Division was played on in the 70s and 80s, some of them are just absolute mud heaps. It's no wonder that the, 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 the Dutch learned how to pass the ball because they preserve pitches where you could do that. Yeah, I mean, our pitch was in pretty bad condition by spring, but it was probably better than Anfield or Highbury in those days, yeah. <laughs> yeah good answer. Um, I remember from being at school in those days that we would – a volunteer to scoop all the snow off the pitch so that we could play. You know, the, there was nothing that was going to stop us. It's not uh, the Dutch yet. way, is it? I, I was, yeah, I remember what I was going to ask you. I was fascinated by you talking about Nayskin's upbringing and how poor it was mm. because the kind of image that the glorious 50s and, and, and so on and, and, and Europe making a, with Marshall Plan money, making a, a rapid recovery from, from the ravages of, of war. How 
how poor was Holland at this time? And how much is the experience of Naiskins typical of, of, of the nation? Naiskins was right at the bottom. He was born in the 51. After the war, the Netherlands is really not a rich country. A lot of people emigrate to Canada, Australia. But the country is picking itself up. But the Naiskins family kind of last of all. His father is a steel worker who on the side demolishes houses, partly because he likes to be outside because in the steel works, it's very hot inside. And then they have this little piece of land where they, they have some animals. His mother has tuberculosis, which sounds like a disease from kind of a long gone era. His mother had tuberculosis and asthma and his sister has epileptic fits. So Neskins has to protect his sister against the bullies. So it's really brutal. And when he leaves school, you know, he can't do school at all. And when he leaves school, he is cleaning floors at the moment when Ajax sign him as an 18 year old. So, I mean, he said that when a player, he saw a player trying to beat him in a match, he thinks, if you go past me, you're stealing my match fee, you're stealing my win bonus. And so he would play with this intense fanaticism. He was feeding his family, you know, from the age of 18. His brother and sister in law were living in a squat, and Naiskins would sometimes spend the night staying in their squat. So he is right next to brutal poverty even when he's at Ajax. And then he loses all his money very quickly himself, which happens to footballers in those days. He starts a, a cafe called Cookies. Cookies, And um, unfortunately, it's not a brilliant business venture. So he goes to Barcelona in 74, partly because he needs to earn lots more money. And for a bit, his salary is paid straight out to his creditors. Wow. And <laughs> and w w was it the Johan Cruyff uh, connection that took him to Barcelona? Yeah, so Kev and Michels had already gone to Barcelona and Michels said, without Neskins, there is no Kev. And they said, look, you've mm. got to come here and win the midfield. And he, I mean, then their nicknames in Spain were Joan Primero and Joan Segundo. And Neskins was Joan Segundo, Joan the second. And he totally accepted that. So he's playing in the service of Kreuf, but often he was more useful than Kreuf because Kreuf would be kicked out of the game a lot mm -hmm. in 70s Spain, where essentially there were no rules, no fouls. And uh, Naiskins in 1976 is voted Spanish Footballer of the Year. And he, he falls in love with Barcelona. You know, at Ajax, they often play in front of 8,000 people. When they go to Germany for the World Cup, they can't believe it because Dutch fans have never traveled abroad. The national team is a joke. Nobody cares about the national team. And the first match against Uruguay, I think it's Uruguay. They look up at the stands and they think, there's 30,000 Dutch people here. What are they here for? And they're amazed. And so uh, he loves Barcelona because there's 100,000 people who really care. He's not used to that. You mentioned his lack of ego, but he's the penalty taker. Yeah, he's, he's stepping he, up he to take the penalty in the first minute of a World Cup final. It's an unusual combination, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, he was very efficient and he was never nervous. He said the only time he was ever nervous on a football field is the first minute of the World Cup final when he has to take a penalty before he's actually touched the ball. Because you remember Holland have this long passing move. Krauf breaks into the German penalty area, actually not quite the penalty area. He's fouled just outside. But he, being Krauf, he manages to dive into the penalty area after being fouled. And the Sineskins has to take the kick, but he hasn't touched the ball. And as he comes running up, or as he's about to run up, Paul Breitner, who you just mentioned, shouts to the keeper, Sepp Meyer, Sepp, it's going to your right. And he says it's in German, but one of the strange things about the final is the Dutch and German players more or less understand each other. So Neskin thinks, yeah, I was going to put it to his right. What do I do now? I haven't even touched the ball. <laughs> so he gets nervous and he mishits it. And that's why in the photos you see dust and red paint, uh, white paint coming up from the penalty spot. Because Naiskins has actually driven the ball into the ground with a little bounce. But the way he kicked penalties, he would just boot this rock-hard 1970s ball as hard as he could, either with his toe or with the instep. And so the keeper would try to get out of the way because if you were hit by a Naiskins penalty, you were in trouble. And so although he mishits it, it still goes rock-hard into the – well, not as hard as usual – into the net. Amazing. Um, clearly, the final is – the the real main event, as it were. But I have a feeling that this victory over Brazil perhaps what was you know the greater achievement. Yeah, I think they were happy to have beaten Brazil. They were fine actually at the time with losing in the final. 
They never expected any of this. Holland been, hadn't been to a World Cup since the 70s. You beat Brazil. You beat the world champions. And at a time when um, the big story in Holland is that there's been an orgy in the Dutch camp, which has really upset Johan Kev's wife, they they were exhausted. They'd been partying the whole tournament. You know, they were always going out in Munster, trying to meet women, a lot of drink. They were quite knackered by the end from all the partying, more than the, from the, the football. The Brazilian and, journals uh, just couldn't believe the Dutch camp. They couldn't believe yeah, it because, you know, the, the, the Brazil camp is very, very military. It's still the time of the military dictatorship. You know, it's very military. And they, they go to the Dutch camp and it's it's, it's just like a 70s free-for-all. Yeah, and the players have to speak to you in German and in uh, Krev would speak Spanish, speak English. And uh, if you bought Krev, if a journalist, clever journalist would bring Krev for a box of cigarettes and then he would speak to you for as long as you wanted. In fact, mm -hmm. Krev liked talking so much that the journalists towards you would be saying, yeah, you know, Johan, I think I'm done. I've got this. <laughs> so um, they all liked talking. They were they were very relaxed mm -hmm. and um, they, they just wanted to meet people as well because they got bored in the camp. So, and, and there'd also been this big party where the scout, the assistant coach, Gorfan Art, who was an alcoholic, had been throwing bottles of champagne out the window and had to be sent home, which unfortunately meant he wasn't able to scout Germany before the final. So the Dutch also had an under scouting problem. <laughs> so losing to Germany, you know, it was just fine. They come back to Holland that night. They're welcomed by huge crowds who are, you know, welcoming them as, as heroes and victors. There were very few people who thought, oh, it's a bit of a shame we lost the final. And Neeskins, what what happens to him afterwards then? I mean, he goes to Barcelona, I get that. Is he able to pay off his creditors, which seem to be one of the issues, and so on eventually? Yeah, he pays off his creditors. He spends five years at Barcelona. He's then um, sent away because they want to sign Alan Simonson as their foreign second foreign player. He, he's in tears on the balcony as Barcelona are celebrating their first ever European trophy in 1979, the European Cup Winners' Cup. He's crying. He can't speak. The crowd outside are chanting Neskins, Neskins. And then he goes to the New York Cosmos. There are some uh, allegations of drink and drugs, which he has always denied. There was a lot of time spent in Studio 54. A good time was had by all. And then the Cosmos kick him out. And it's 1981. Holland have to qualify for the World Cup 82 by beating Belgium and France. Naiskens returns, lives with the national team manager for several weeks, trains himself into fitness. We beat Belgium 3-0. It's one of the most exciting nights of my childhood. And then in the crunch match against France in Paris, we lose 2-0. Naiskens is the last match for Holland. You know, he's not given a farewell match. He's not even, I think, given a, a bunch of flowers. Uh, he's, just, he's just forgotten. They say, OK, goodbye. But he's far from forgotten now, obviously. Yeah, uh, when yeah. he died, I think everyone suddenly realised, my God, I loved Neskin. So Laurent Kuman, who's the Holland manager now, put it best. He said, when I was a boy playing on the street in the 1970s, I wanted to be Neskins. Because hmm. you, you, you couldn't be Cruyff, could you? You couldn't. Only only Cruyff could be Cruyff. I love that line from Cruyff after he's he's been talking for hours and the fellow doesn't understand. And he's him saying something like, "Well, if I wanted you to under, understand, I would have explained it better." <laughs> <laughs> I think Neskins really admired Cruyff's football, but he admired even more the way Cruyff could talk. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like you can't pay tribute to Neskins without paying tribute to what? What about his his, his, his coaching career? Because obviously Cruyff goes on to have an, an extraordinary and very influential coaching career. Neskins tries, doesn't he? What what what, what did his, his career bring? He coached some small Swiss clubs. He coaches Neck in a small club in Holland. But he doesn't... Kreif always was the main character. Neskens didn't want to be the main character. Neskens wanted to be a supporting character. And so he's happiest, I think, when he's assistant coach with Holland in the 98 World Cup. And he's assistant to Van Gregard at Barcelona in the early 2000s. There's photographs of Neskens on the training field with the young Leo Messi. He he was a loyal guy. He didn't want to talk in public. He he didn't want to be the main man. And so he didn't have a big coaching career, but he didn't want a big coaching career. He wanted a small one. And then he ended up working for this organization called World Coaches, Dutch Foreign Ministry and the Dutch Football Association. will send coaches around the world to coach children, often children who've had disadvantages or traumas. And he died actually while doing that in Algeria. He had at age 73, he was coaching kids in Algeria when he suddenly keels over. Didn't he have a time in South Africa? 
Yeah, he ends his career. His last club is the Mamelodi Sundowns. Um, I think there's issues with fans and uh, there's a lot of problems. And he thinks, right, I'm not going to do this again. Because th that's quite interesting as well, because the Mamelodi Sundowns were the Brazilians. That was their yeah. idea. And they then, play yeah, and then um, when South Africa was hosting the World Cup, Brazilian coaches came over. You know, there were a couple of Brazilian coaches with the national team, the one or two others in the in the uh, in, in the domestic league, and the South Africans realised, much to their surprise, blimey, these Brazilian coaches are all so defensive. It's all they care about. This, this is not what we'd signed up for. Yeah. So I remember seeing the Mami, Mamelodi Sundowns at a kind of soccer ex exhibition. And they'd rebranded themselves as as cry fights. That they'd, right. uh, okay. they'd abandoned Brazil for 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 the Dutch way. So that I think is why Nashkins found his way there. Um, as we always do, uh, Simon, on the Brazilian shirt name podcast. I mean, it's a brilliant tribute, by the way, uh, to Nashkins. I think he would be somewhat I embarrassed. Learned so much about would. so much about the man in his context. Thinking, he would have said, what, knew. "Why are you doing this? Let's let's talk about crowd." Yeah, well, we're talking about mm -hmm. Naskin. So um, we always look at this sort of musical backdrop to uh, the match that we um, are talking about. So we've been talking about the July the 3rd uh, World Cup match between Brazil and the Netherlands in 1974. It's well worth a look, I think it's fair to say. Uh, you won't quite believe what you see in comparison. There's some to football, how... there's some boxing, there's some there's water everything. polo. It's all going on. <laughs> I missed the water polo, but I must watch it again. <laughs> Happy to do that. But we always look at the musical soundtrack of the time by going to the charts, the British charts at the time. I know that you were too young. I know you were too young to follow this stuff. But may I just say, I I apologise to the memory of Charles Aznavour for thinking the number one song at the time was the worst thing I'd ever heard, and it you're, stayed. It you're stayed talking to a naturalised Frenchman now. Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. Um, she or L, as you French would say, um, at number one in the charts. What do you make of it? Naskins was most closely identified with a Dutch band that I'm guessing you haven't heard of called The Cats. The Cats were kind of, I think they were hard rockers of the early 70s. They love football. The footballers love the Cats. And so the Cats actually come to the famous party, which ends in an orgy. And Naskins would go around to Cats concerts. He also liked Golden Earring, which were a Dutch band that made it. Of course, of Europe. course. Um, what is, uh, Radar Love? Golden Earring? Is it Radar uh, Love? I, I think that's the I big one. I trust you on this more than I trust me. And I've heard he liked the Rolling Stones. But he liked kind of, you know, yeah. things with this a heart. Exactly, exactly what you would imagine from looking at him. And, and He's not know. going to like these charts then. No, he isn't. <laughs> He's not going to like is, is, there, is there a Dutch thing connection with Curved Air as well? Was it was Curved Air? Was there Singer Dutch? Sonia, whatever her name is? Are you That's getting me on some territory that I'm not comfortable on? I, I don't know. I, I can tell you that there's a Leicester connection with the number five uh, group, Shawadi Wadi. Um, <laughs> in fact, let's face it, in the top ten, thank goodness for the drifters of kissing in the back row of the movies. It's such a strange time. I remember it so vividly, you know, because nine years old. And it, it, this is a moment where T-Rex have peaked. Slade, uh, after, have, yeah. yeah, Slade are on the downward slide, yeah, and they were the two big bands of the early seventies. Well, and, unfortunately, Gary Glitter is in the mix yeah. as well. And what, what, what? Every time we look at the chart from from this this um, era, the thing that really strikes me is how so many things are a retread of the fifties. Yeah, hundred percent. Wadi Wadi, even a Gary Glitter is a retread. One who fascinates me is Roy Wood. Yep, that's a different thing, but it's not Scottish reggae, whatever he wants to call no. it. It's going down the road. Roy Woods, who comes out of the move, who are kind of Sergeant Pepper-inspired Brummy Beatles, and then by the, the early 70s, he's done his wizard, wizard thing, and it's all kind of 50s rock and roll. Do you yeah. know where Roy Wood was last heard of? Um, I don't know, pointing angel fingers, you know, angel fingers or whatever it's called. No, it's more, depressing, was more depressing than that. Prominent in the UKIPs. Oh, well. Who'd, that, who'd have thought it? Well, you know. It's, it's one inspiring. of the reasons why I think that Simon yeah. Cooper doesn't doesn't live in England anymore. Is Possibly. it? Yeah. yeah. Well, some of us ain't got a choice, mate. Uh, Terry Jacks. Was that? Was Terry Jacks? Wasn't he? A, did, did he not have a Dutch connection, Terry Jacks? Am I misthinking this completely? No, if he did, he, he'd, he'd have sung it, Shijans in the Shun. 
Yeah, well, here he's just got, if you go away, at number 26. There's a few tunes. I mean, Tim is absolutely right. And at this point, believe it or not, Simon, um, mm -hmm. I was probably the only black teddy boy in Britain, apart from the drummer of Shawadi Wadi, who doesn't count, in my view. There's and, a whole memo on that. Oh, there is. Oh, trust me. Uh, mm -hmm. It's already been written, unfortunately, but there is an old <laughs> a whole memo on that. But for me, at number two, the Drifters were like from the 50s, so Kissing in the Back Row, a little bit of a doo whoppy kind of thing, was absolutely brilliant, I thought. At number five, Shawadi Wadi, Hey Rock and Roll, I would have thrown the glass at the television, except that we were renting it from Radio <laughs> Rentals at the time. And, uh, well, you laugh. 10cc at number 11, it's a rock and yes, roll. Yes, yes. Now, 10cc well. 10 are interesting, aren't they? An interesting kind of a group of very very clever it's mancunian jews and th there's there's something really distinctive and really intelligent about about what what they were doing at this time i think they were absolutely at their peak at this time when you got all because you've you got different and one of them had been a, a had been a, a, a 60s chart throb uh, you know uh, uh, others uh, uh, so i think that there, there's really there's combinations there and they're firing off in lots of different directions i find them really interesting 10 cc Hundred um, percent. I don't know if you want to add to that, Simon. Uh, as I say, I am being dragged away from my <laughs> Naskin's unique knowledge. I will, I will try and drag you back to to something that may be more on your your home turf because one song which I think is very interesting here is Alan Number Price. 32. Oh right, Alan, yeah. I, was, I, knew, I thought you were going to mention that. I thought you were going to mention the, that. The Jarrow yeah. song because yeah. seventy four. We're talking about almost the height of the trade union movement. Uh, and the, the Jarro song is looking back, obviously, to, to the yeah. Jarro marches of, of the 30s. And there, there was almost a feeling at that time, the trade unions, it, was, it wasn't it was just an association to get better wages or something. For some people, it was almost like a religious quest, the trade union movement. Uh, it was it, there, there was a kind of revivalism in there. There was this kind of collective idea that things were going to get better as a result of collective action during during the uh, through the trade union movement and if you talk, if you if you talk to the youngsters these days about that kind of feel they they can have no possible conception of what you're talking about and this means quite a lot to me because I'm a child of the welfare state I'm a child of 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 those of, of council housing and comprehensive education and national health and, and university education when they paid you to go. All the stuff that has has been demolished with just ab such absolute stupidity over, over the last few years is has the demolition of of that. Is that one of the factors that that pushed you out um, out of the UK? I'd like to say it was, but no, I lived in the London economy as a as a young adult at the time, and I was about 30. And the London economy, the problem is the problem of success. In that it just London became a hyper expensive city. I could not afford to buy anywhere there. So I bought somewhere in Paris and moved over there. And then, you know, I saw the horror of Brexit unfolding and the country behind London sort of collapsing while London remained very powerful and successful. So um yeah, I, I didn't leave Britain, I left London. Yeah, that Good makes point. sense. Well, yeah. it's it's the kind of consideration me and my wife uh, genuinely uh, deliberating at the moment. The Jarrow song, I think, is interesting. Uh, the refrain of it is, is it, Geordie, go to London? Go to London, like, mm -hmm. you know, go west once upon a time. But the musical uh, landscape of it goes back to the 30s. At some point, so I'm thinking, is this Bugsy Malone or is it The Sting? <laughs> you know, the musical yeah. palette is very different from what you would have expected uh, ordinarily from Alan Price, if you would expect anything in particular. Before we dismiss this chart, so we've got to get to number 31 in just a moment. Uh, so is it 31? No, 32. Apologies. In just a moment, we'll get there. Scotland... Wait your turn. We're going to get there. <laughs> there, there are a few really interesting. I George think, McRae, um, "Rock Your Baby." It's the exactly. start of the disco boom. Isn't it? That's it's exactly the start of, what I was going to it's say. The start That's of May Skins ended up in Studio Fifty Four. Is George McRae? <laughs> Good link. I like the way you've done that. But I was going to say exactly the same thing. This was the first time, and you just said it better. 
No, no, I wouldn't have said it. I wouldn't have added the Nayskins connection, but this is the first time that disco has come to the surface on top of the pops. I remember George McRae being mm. on top of the pops. I, I was probably like about 12 or 13 when I started going to discos for 18 year olds and so on. But that was the landscape that I was living in at the time. But it was very much an underground music at this point. You know, the disco artists were not, were only in the discos. You didn't hear them on radio. You didn't certainly didn't see them on TV, something like Top of the Pops. Suddenly, this guy that's straight out of the disco movement, with an oddity for him, I think this was his first purely disco track, as it were, but it's so amazing. It gets to number one eventually, but at the moment it's at number 15, going up with a bullet, as they say, in its second week. The other interesting ones... <laughs> I'd like to dismiss the Wombles. They've got a couple of tracks in there, but I think I should mention at number 12, they've got something called Banana Rock, which would be illegal to play nowadays because they're basically taking the piss out of Caribbean people, not even in a funny way. You know, like typically Tropical did that. Whoa, I'm going to Barbados. This is the most shocking, shocking um, stereotype of uh, negritude, if you like. Uh, that I've ever come across, including, I'm going to slip on my banana. <laughs> it is terrible. Mm. But Liverpool Lou by The Scaffold, it's in the kind of vein of Alan Price, I would say, in that it's something that looks back in time, mm. um, poetically as well as musically. But then there are some other crackers. Elton John's at number 18, Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me. It's certainly one of his best, in my view. Cockney Rebel with Judy Teen at number 19, for example. And then you get to Summer Breeze by the Isley Brothers yeah, at number so I think 22. It's, it's quite a good time for black music. William, William B. Devon, just, just be thankful for what you got. Indeed. If you want something older, more traditional, you've got the Staples Singers. Yes. Um, the Isleys with that little rock thing they've got in, that they've got going there. Um, yeah, I think so. Th that's where it seems to me the best stuff is happening at this point. But at number American 32, music. just to remind us that there's a World Cup going on, there's a song called Easy Easy by the Scotland World <laughs> Cup squad. And I feel really sorry for them because they don't, they're not talking about it's so easy we're going to win the World Cup, which is the way that it's interpreted. No, they they're did actually, that four years later, didn't they? Like, well, how did that work out for them, I wonder? Yeah, okay. But at this point, all they're saying is it's easy to be a Scottish football fan. And I, I'm with them on that. It is easy. You're going to have the most fun. You're going to be the party involved. But yeah, unwise decision, these World Cup uh, National World Cup songs, would you not say, Simon? And did the Dutch do them? Did they go in for, for, for schlock like that? Uh, I think there have been a couple. In 78, there was a song by comedians, uh, Paul Crowe over the line, I get him to come to Argentina after all, which was a big kind of national movement. That, that, the story of him boycotting the World Cup um, in protest at the Argentina military dictatorship is totally false, isn't it? It's totally it, false, yeah. Uh, it was. He made um, it very clear well before Argentina's military dictatorship had taken over that he didn't want to do it again. He couldn't. He hated being away from his family, and when his wife read about the the story in Built the German tabloid, Krauf Champagne and Naked Girls, and he was spent the days before the final on the phone to his wife all day uh, from the one payphone in the Dutch camp that he just he then resolved i'm never ever going to go away to a world cup again mm -hmm. the, he wasn't you know this is idea that Krauf was a kind of lefty just because he had long hair yeah uh, the only political cause he ever cared about was lower taxes for rich people for himself yes <laughs> well for himself and for other rich people mostly for himself so at one point he buttonholes the dutch queen i think it's after the 74 defeat uh they're invited to uh meet the queen and he says to her look you know while we're here uh, maybe you could lower taxes. And she says, I think you need to speak to one of the ministers. <laughs> yeah. so does yeah. anyway. I don't have the power. Was that Queen Juliana? It was remember. Juliana, yeah. 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 Well, yeah. I'm <laughs> sorry, he didn't know much about the way that power works and where uh, power lies. But I noticed that earlier on you, you referred to the Dutch as we. In it's, football. It's, yeah. I yeah. noticed that. I did notice that as well. Uh, I mean, you know, like Arsenal fans talk of Arsenal. I, I'm not Dutch. 
I'm very fond of the country. I lived there for nine years as a child, and it's it's my football upbringing. It's the football culture I care about. And as Craig said, football is a game that you play with your head. Every decision on the field has to be intelligent and thought through. As Bergkamp says, behind every ball, there has to be a thought. So that's the football I grew up with. Mm -hmm. Football is about space and about decisions. And so when I came to England and I discovered they thought football was a reenactment of World War One, I was very puzzled. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, we won that one and all. Um, the couple of tunes I would just reference before we wrap this conversation up. Uh, Tim's already mentioned William Devaughan's Be Thankful for What You've Got. Number 48 generally is one of my all-time favourite songs, but that goes hand in hand with number 46, the staple singers, If You're Ready, Come Go With Me. And then just one more that I don't think we should leave this conversation without at least pointing people to this, because People forget the original to this song. Uh, Freddie McGregor, the reggae star, who mm. is struggling with a stroke now, but still somehow managing to get up on stage, uh, covered it. And Freddie McGregor's got a lovely voice, but when the main ingredients sing Just Don't Want to Be Lonely, in that 1970s, mid-1970s, kind of cheesy American soul song way, they get away with it. It's it's a it's a classic now, I would like to say. Okay, the very beginning, it's kind of like, is she really going out with him? That kind of thing, which you could lose. But after that, you're hearing one of the all-time great ballads here. And, well, you, you, uh, you know the secret? What's the, the secret? The secret is sincerity. If you can fake that, you've got everything. Yeah, another one. I'll call these jokes um, Legendino-esque. They're um, all right. Yeah, yeah, oh, we haven't mentioned well. Sparks. This this town ain't yeah, big enough for the both of us. I thought it's, I was going to mention it. it but... It's the one. I remember watching this on yeah. Top of the Pops. And it's one of those. There are a couple of moments when my dad, my dad was too old for youth culture. There are a couple of moments when he nearly put his foot through the screen. Yeah. One was the Sex Pistols being on, on, Phil, uh, on Bill Grundy. Yeah, what a yeah. fucking rotter. What a day. Okay, <laughs> Tim, you'd have to repeat it. We know what they said. And the other one was was uh, the one who looked like Hitler. Was it yeah, Ron or Russell yeah, Mayer, yeah, whoever it was, yeah. you know, just there on their keyboards. For some reason, Smiling. it just sent, him over, just sent him over the edge, the little yeah. Hitler moustache. <laughs> he could have looked at it like a Charlie Chaplin moustache, but it uh, did look more like Adolf Hitler, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, that's it from us. This is a wrap. It's been amazing. Simon, really, thank you very much. Um, yeah. I think uh, the knowledge that you've imparted on Johan Nishkins, or Nishkins. Hey. Yeah, I know. I got it wrong, and I corrected myself before you came in. You had it's Balakaluk. Balakaluk. Getting it wrong after all this time. It's Balakaluk. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. <laughs> Get it right, Sim, you know. Um, no, it's been amazing, Simon. Thank you very much. And yeah. Simon Cooper, our guest, uh, football and writer, please, extraordinaire. Please, Simon, just to end, tell us about your latest book. Uh, my latest book is Impossible City about Paris. And at the same time, I published a book about British political corruption called Good Chaps. But I'm also hosting a podcast that everybody should listen to because it's a football podcast called Heroes, Heroes and, and Humans. Yes. Indeed. Yeah, I was going to mention that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Simon that. Cooper. I knew you'd get that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and you've done a tribute to Johan Neskins there as well. So we're happy to, you know, ride off the back of that. That doesn't well. once mention the word balakaluk. Uh, no, the Naskins tribute is entirely in uh, English. People will be pleased to hear. <laughs> Delighted. Simon, thank you very much.